Hey guys, it's Dr. Childs. Today I want to talk about reverse T3, um, pretty much everything that you need to know about reverse T3 actually, but uh, specifically I'm going to be talking about what causes it, um, what to do about it if it's high, and then uh, basically the steps that you should be taking um, to implement these strategies into your life. So um, if you're not aware of what reverse T3 is and you have thyroid disease, um, hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's, if you're post-RAI, if you're post-thyroidectomy, reverse T3 is actually a, a pretty important um, thyroid lab test that you at least want to have a basic or cursory understanding of. And so that's kind of what I'm going to help um, help us go into right now. So what is reverse T3? <clears throat> um, you guys probably know, uh, I would say, a fair amount about thyroid physiology if, you, if you're listening to this, but um, I'm going to go over it just for those who uh, may not be familiar with it. So first of all, you have two main, well you have more than that, but we're going to make this a little bit simple. You have, let's just think about thyroid hormone in your body as two main thyroid hormones, so T4 and then T3. And so you guys are familiar with T4 and T3, especially T4 because most of the, the medications that doctors give are T4 only thyroid hormones. So that would be things like Synthroid, level thyroxin, levoxyl, tyrosin, etc. Um, those are medications that contain the T4 um, thyroid hormone only. Okay, now that is that should be um, that should be put aside in a different place compared to T3 because T3 is the active hormone. Okay, so T3 actually does all of the good things that you associate thyroid hormone doing. Right, it gets into the cell via nuclear receptor, activates genetic transcription, turns on genes that increase. Um, uh, metabolites in the mitochondria, you know, activates directly hair follicles to help with hair growth, increases basal metabolic rate through mitochondrial production, you know, has a direct effect on cardiac myocytes, yada, 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 right? All of that is done by T3, not T4, okay? So doctors give you T4, and even though it's the inactive hormone, and they just kind of say, okay, well, the body should know what to do with it. And so what happens in the body is your body kind of, and I, I show this in a diagram here, um, T4 has the, has, your body has the option to turn it into T3, which you want, and that's good, but it can also, you know, there's a fork in the road here, and it can kind of also turn it into reverse T3. Um, and what you'll find is that this is kind of like a, uh, you know, just use it as a basic example. Imagine a stream that's going down and, you know, and it's, it's just by itself, and then there's like a big rock in the middle, and it's splitting half of the stream to the left and half of the stream to the right. So really what's happening here is the, the, the size of that rock, you know, a number of other factors kind of determine which, which way it's going to go, more to the left or more to the right. So you can kind of think of your body in that sense where there's a constant amount of T4 coming, which is the stream, and then there's a number of factors, in this case the rock, but we're going to talk about those factors, that can kind of shift the amount of thyroid hormone that you're producing just constantly, okay? So I want you to think of this not as like a one-time thing, like T4 goes to T3 good, or T4 goes to reverse T3 bad. No, this is happening constantly in your body. It's being you know, met by local demand. If, if some tissues need more thyroid hormone, this is gonna happen more frequently. If you, do an, if you do other things that are harmful to your body to slow your metabolism down, like calorie-restricted dieting, your body's gonna put the brake on it, and it's gonna say, well, let's create more reverse T3 than, T, than T3. So the ratio might be something like, <clears throat> in that setting where it's, it's not gonna be very good, maybe 70% of, of your T4 is gonna go to reverse T3, 30% is gonna go to T3. Now, even though you are, creating some T3, a higher or disproportionate amount is going to be that reverse T3. Okay, so in, in a most basic sense, that's why this matters because T4, which is what most that which is what what you're probably taking right now if you're listening to this, has to turn into T3 in order for it to do any good in your body. Okay, T4 otherwise you can have plenty of T4 T4 thyroid hormone in your blood, but if unless it's converting, it's it's relatively useless. Okay, um, and actually, I won't go into this a lot here because I have other videos that. Um, discuss it, but basically what can happen sometimes is you can give somebody T4 and um, like a patient T4 and due to a number of factors they can turn a lot of it into reverse T3 and reverse T3 actually directly competes for, for binding, they kind of challenge one another, right? So if you have more reverse T3 to T3, <clears throat> you're going to get those negative side effects, not the positive ones that you want. So in a sense if I'm giving you T4, you can take that T4 and just turn it into reverse T3 and uh, you know we a bad cycle can ensue where we, you can actually kind of make things worse. Okay, so in a nutshell, in a very basic sense, that's reverse T3. Yes, it's it's much more complex than that, um, but I you know let's just leave it leave it like this for now. Um, you know, and and to to sum it up, T3 hormone is good. Reverse T3 is bad generally, right? Generally, um, if you have thyroid disease, that, that's mostly true. So why do you even have reverse T3? Well. It's actually a brilliant system that your body's created, okay? Um, so let's say that you're sick in the hospital or 
your body needs to use nutrients for some other purpose other than you know increasing your metabolism or growing your hair right if you have a if you have an illness in your body and you're fighting for your life you're not your body doesn't really care so much about how what your hair follicles are are doing right so instead it shunts that elsewhere and so it turns down the production and so reverse T3 is felt to be kind of this the, the way that your body manages thyroid hormone kind of kind of coming in and out constantly okay and so it's it's meant to be there as a good thing it just it's just that there's many factors which we'll go over later that humans weren't really designed to deal with constantly that have kind of churned this system which is supposed to be good into something that is kind of causing a lot of problems for a lot of patients okay and this is true in a lot of things in medicine okay same concept as insulin resistance right your body is doing the, the thing that it's supposed to which is pumping out insulin when sugar comes but then that high level insulin causes resistance which makes everything worse so this is kind of a similar concept in that this is a good system that was meant to, to have a, a, a true good purpose in your body. But as a result of other factors and variables, it's kind of gone out of whack. Okay, and so one of, one of the, the syndromes, and I say this, you know, because a lot of people will say to their doctor, hey, well, let's check my reverse T3, and they're like, what, are you crazy? And they, they just, they don't understand its importance, although they do, if they just went back and they thought about it, because, I, and I'll explain this to you, there's a, there's a condition called, and every doctor who's ever been in the hospital is well aware of this condition, it's called euthyroid sick syndrome. Okay, and what, what it is, is, and this is one of the reasons that doctors don't like checking thyroid hormone of any kind, TSH, T3, whatever, T4, they don't like checking it in any patient who's hospitalized, because they're going to be crazy, they, they're always they're always abnormal. And so this, this was given a name, right? They call it the euthyroid sick syndrome, which basically means when you're sick, your thyroid is crazy, but your thyroid's functioning okay. And so part of this condition is um, that, that causes this is that you have low free T3, you have high reverse T3, and normal T4 and TSH levels. And so this is one of the reasons that when patients are in the ICU and they're septic and they're sick or, or any number, they have a really bad infection or they have really bad trauma, you just don't check their thyroid because they're going to be very interesting. And doctors know that. They just don't understand that that some of this has crept into the the day-to-day -day lives of many patients out here through through the mechanisms that we're going to discuss a little bit lower. So yes, your doctor is aware of this even if they're not thinking on on the same wavelength that we're talking about here. Um, so the question is that you're probably asking is are you pooling reverse T3 in your body? And a pooling is just a fancy term to say you have a lot of it, right? A lot of it in your blood more than you should. So what are the symptoms or you know what what might you expect if you have high reverse T3 levels? Let's assume that you never even checked your blood. Um, and you don't know, so, so what are those symptoms? So first of all, lower than normal metabolism, um, and that's because, like I said, uh, reverse T3 directly competes for T3, which means if you have high reverse T3, you're going to have less of the action of T3 on the mitochondria, which means a, slow, a lower metabolic rate, um, which brings us to the next one, which is constant weight gain. That generally occurs without changing any of your eating habits, right? Second thing is crushing fatigue. Again, mitochondrial production uh, is, uh, is what produces ATP, which is the energy in your body. So low levels of ATP from any cause will result in the symptom of fatigue, along with a number of other, right? You can have brain-based fatigue, I understand. But for now, just focus on the fact that um, mitochondrial in this setting is going to reduce your reduce ATP production for the mitochondria is going to result in low energy levels. Um, you can have worsening symptoms of hypothyroidism. Chronic pain is another big one. Um, and then depression, anxiety, or bipolar disorder. So those type of symptoms tend to go along with it. So now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about all of the causes. So you can see here there's quite a few. I'm going to go over these. Um, you can see this graphic if you want by going to this, um, to going to this page. Um, but basically, I'm going to be verbalizing this anyway, so it's not, it's not so important. So um, basically, we're going to, let's go over these things uh, of what causes high reverse T3 in your body. So number one, and this is something that probably, and this is the reason why so many people have high reverse T3 levels, because one of the main reasons that I see reverse T3 levels being so high is calorie restricted dieting, okay? Especially anything that lowers your 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 uh, the amount of calories you you take in each day by like, you know, less than a thousand for any sustained period of time. The magic number if there was one, I I, I kind of don't I wouldn't go along with any, you know, I ever say there's like a hard and fast rule here, but generally studies have shown if you do 21 days of constant calorie restriction, that's enough to cause all of these negative side effects. Okay, so 21 days of a 500 calorie or 1000 calorie diet will result in metabolic damage. And what happens is when your body, when you drop those calories, your body compensates by dropping your metabolism. It just makes sense. And the analogy I use is, let's say you're making $100,000 per year and you're spending $100,000 per year. In this case, you're, the amount that you're earning is your metabolism, um, or I'm sorry, how much like food you're taking in, and then the amount that you burn is your metabolism. So then let's say you get a pay cut down to $50,000 per year. Are you going to keep spending $100,000 per year? No, because you'll run out of money, right? It's just not going to happen. So what do you do? 
as your money decreases, you're going to match your spending to that amount of money. So it's the exact same thing your body does. This is not rocket science. This is just, this is just how your body compensates. So if you consume 1,000 calories per day, your body's going to say, hey, I'm burning 2,000 calories per day, but I can't keep this up forever, so how about I drop my calories down to 1,000? And so that's what happens. Now the problem is, when this occurs, your body doesn't just say, oh, now, <clears throat> now you're consuming 2,000 calories. Let me increase back up to the 2,000 I was before. No, that does not happen. In fact, studies show that that damage stays for up to six years as far as we know. It may even be longer, right? So when you calorie restrict yourself and you do these yo-yo diets, you are damaging your metabolism for six years, at least as far as we know, assuming you do 21 days. Now, everyone's a little bit different, right? So it may not be as, as severe in you or somebody else. But this explains how some patients can say, well, I'm only eating 1,000 calories per day, and I'm, if I eat 1,200 calories per day, I'm gaining weight. The doctor looks at them, they're like, are you crazy? And you're like, no, I, mean, I swear to you, I'm only eating this amount. This is how that happens, okay? It's a real thing. It happens. It's, again, it's not rocket science. It's, it's very basic if you just think about it from an intuitive standpoint. So that's number one, and it's very common, of course, because everyone's doing dieting of some, some sort. Everyone's done some sort of diet in their, in their past. In fact, the more that you diet, obviously, the worse that this gets. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, chronic illness and infections. Now, don't, don't focus on the infection part. I mean, it is true if you have chronic EBV infections and bacterial overgrowth syndromes and fungal overgrowth syndrome, et cetera, but I'm talking more about the chronic illness that many of you may be suffering from. So that's things that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, things that you might be, chronic conditions that you might be taking medications for hypertension, which is high blood pressure, high cholesterol, insulin resistance, diabetes, you know, any sort of chronic joint pain, anything like that takes a toll on your body. Why? Because your body has to compensate to try and react to it. All right. And we weren't intended, <clears throat> humans weren't intended to be on six plus medications or five plus medications, which is what I think the average person over age 50 is on. That, that basically is saying to me that those people have at minimum five problems that they shouldn't be having that they're dealing with every single day. Now, you know, consider that and multiply it times 20 years. You, you, you really don't think that's going to have some impact on your body? Of course it is. Now, this should be differentiated from acute illness, of course, which is like if you get pneumonia or you're septic and you're landing in the hospital, that's a huge stress on your body. You're going to have to deal with it, okay? And, you know, it's going to be, you're going to have some high reverse T3s as a result of that. But I'm talking about day-to-day -day things that may not, even, may not even be symptomatic for, but that wear your body down slowly over time, okay? That's what this is referring to, the chronic illness and infection. Um, by the way, this can be from people that have, um, you know, there's a lot of patients out there who have um, diabetes and then they get chronic infections as well in their feet or whatever it is and you require multiple rounds of antibiotics or chronic sinus infections or periodontal disease, et cetera. All that's included in here. Um, I, you know, again, you can read more about all that stuff here. I'm just kind of giving you a, a brief overview. Number three, chronic inflammation. So this is important because any cause of inflammation decreases T4 to T3 conversion and increases T4 to reverse T3 conversion, okay? Now, don't let that confuse you. The bottom line is inflammation equals high levels of reverse T3, all right? But inflammatory states are really what we want to focus on. And what are those? Untreated autoimmune disease, you know, if you're not focusing on the inflammatory autoimmune component, if you're just taking medications for it or trying to suppress it with prednisone, then that's not, you know, going to do you much good either. Um, leptin resistance is another one. Insulin resistance is another one. Intestinal dysbiosis or SIBO is even a gut um, an inflammatory gut condition, uh, num any, basically any cause of inflammation. And it, you can check for inflammatory markers by checking ESR, CRP, ferritin, stuff like that. It's not, it's not too hard to look at. Um, untreated uh, gut infections, maybe that's why I didn't talk about SIBO up in the infl inflammatory part because now we're going to talk about it. So up to 20% of T4 is converted to T3 in the GI tract, and this is shown in studies. You can, you can check out the studies in which I show you. But that means that the, the gut is converting up to one-fifth of that total amount. So if you have anything that would inhibit the gastrointestinal conversion of T4 to T3, uh, that would affect your whole entire body, right? So any inflammatory GI condition, so that includes SIBO, dysbiosis, reflux, GERD, yeast overgrowth syndromes or bacterial overgrowth syndrome, uh, syndromes, history of chronic antibiotic use or inflammatory bowel disease or irritable bowel syndrome even, um, any of those things will limit the amount of T4 to T3 that you're converting. And this is probably why many people intuitively know that you need to treat your GI tract. I mean, everyone kind of knows that, right? They come to me and they're like, oh, I know I need to treat my GI tract. Well, this is why. Like, this is just the science behind why it's helpful. They might not know why it's helpful, but they know they need to do it. This is part of that reason, okay? Um, another one, and I won't talk too much about it, but any sort of emotional or physiological stressor, so that could be family life, divorce, death of a loved one, et cetera, uh, motor, vehicle accident, or motor vehicle accidents, traumatic brain injury, 
a bunch of other things can cause it, but anything that causes stress to you. And then, of course, one of the interesting things is uh, another one, the last one we're going to talk about is medications. So uh, blood pressure medications are notorious for this, beta blockers specifically. So propranolol would be one. That's often taken for anxiety and a number of other, number of other conditions. So what they do is they kind of slow down your metabolism and they blunt that effect, that T4 to T3 conversion, which means you necessarily get high reverse T3. Okay, uh, antidepressants are another one, anti-seizure medications, narcotics, of course, now, you might read this and say, well, I need to go off my med. I'm not telling you to go off your medication. I am not telling you to, to stop taking your medication. That would, that's not a good idea. It's not healthy. However, what I am telling you is, let's say that if you have a condition that is treatable that you're on medication for, okay, well, then in that case, maybe it's a good idea to try to naturally lower your blood pressure by helping, with, by helping um, you know, lose weight or whatever it is. If that's the case, you'll often find if you can lose 20, 30 pounds, your blood pressure will normalize by itself, and then you can come off of that. Now, dropping that weight and getting off that blood pressure medication will likely Im increase your thyroid function, but don't just go off your medication, you know, right? Do, do not do that. Um, let's see. So here's, your, you know, this is a very basic, very, very basic image of what I was talking about with the inflammation. So any sort of immune dysregulation leads to inflammation, which leads to decreased T4 conversion um, in the thyroid, and that's why it's important. So let's talk about this, um, this image in terms of how to test for it and, and why this is important. So this is an image that shows your thyroid hormones concentration. So this dashed line up here is reverse T3. This dashed line down here is TSH. Um, and then you can kind of see T3 and T4. And this, this little thing's kind of in our way, but I'll try and uh, move it so you can see now. Um, now what it is on the x-axis is we're showing the degree of thyroid dysfunction um, that you have and how, how, or I'm sorry, the degree of... Um, uh, like what is happening inside your body. So if, you're, if, you're, if you have chronic illness or if you're acutely ill or anything like that, and then we're showing you over a time period and, and how based on how bad this, uh, this illness is, what happens to your thyroid function. Okay, so you can see here that it, all in this middle section here, so for this dark line, anything in here shows relatively normal thyroid function. So you can have severe illness and still your TSH and your free T4 will still be kind of in the normal range. But if you look at these, look at what these outliers are. And this is why this is so important. So you see T3 dips down considerably. And you see reverse T3 dips down uh, or dips up quite a bit. So if you look at the difference between these two, it's massive. All right. This is why the reverse T3 to free T3 ratio is the most sensitive marker <clears throat> for determining how sick you actually are and how, how well your thyroid is actually functioning. So if you look at TSH, TSH doesn't even really go up until you're in the recovery phase. You can have severe and moderate issues in thyroid function and still be in the normal range. Same thing with T4. It does start to dip down here. Free T4 and total T4 start to dip down around the severe area, but they're, they're just, they pale in comparison to the difference between RT3 and T3, which is why one of the most important ways to assess for how well you're functioning is this RT3 to T3 ratio or reverse T3 to T3 ratio. So when we're looking at when we're looking at do you have reverse T3 issues? Do you have proper thyroid function? You know, are you suffering from any of those issues I listed above? The absolute best way to assess for this is the ratio between the free T3 and the reverse T3. And this is taken very simply by dividing the free T3 by the reverse T3 and then determining how much of one do you have to the other. So, and I can I can make this very simple for you. I mean, if you if you want to look here, um, you can look at the ratio and that ratio wants to be 0 0.20 or greater than 0 0.20. If it's anything less, that means you have too much reverse T3 and too little free T3, right? So if you just think about this, you don't even have to actually do the calculation to look at it. Like if you look at your reverse T3 and it's 20 um, and your free T3 is, in, is low, you know automatically your, your ratio is going to be less than 0.2, right? But, it, but w the reason that you need to do this and the reason this is important because let's say I give you lyothyronine or Cytomel, which is the T3 thyroid hormone medication. I can artificially bump up those, those T3 levels and your body may in a compensatory reaction increase reverse T3. So if your free T3 is high and your reverse T3 is, let's say, moderate, um, you still may have plenty of free T3 relative to reverse T3 and it's not really an issue. But I can tell you from experience, pretty much any time that I actually check a patient um, who's done like the HCG diet, I see a very, very high reverse T3 level like in the 30s and I see a very, very low free T3 level. And that's exactly what we're seeing here, severe issues, low free T3 and high reverse T3, okay? So what do you do about it? Um, we'll talk about some of these things. I'll, I'll do it a little bit briefly here, but um, first of all, you can you can basically flush it out. You can flush out the reverse T3 with T3 containing medications. So the medicines that you can consider using: lyothyronine, Cytomel, or even sustained release T3. Now, can you use NDT? Yes, you can use NDT, but you have to remember that NDT is mostly T4. And if you recall back to the beginning of our conversation here, I mentioned to you that giving somebody T4 
can cause higher levels of reverse T3. So really, if you're on NDT, you probably, you're probably better off if you drop that NDT dose and just add in some T3 temporarily to flush that out. Um, as long as you treat the underlying condition, you sh it shouldn't come back, but sometimes it does. It just depends on the person and, and how vigilant they are in treating their underlying issue. Um, but can you use NDT? Yeah, you can. Uh, it's not my preference, but uh, you know, sometimes you need to, sometimes you can. Um, it's a lot better if you just start someone on just t you know, some, some lower doses of T3 and they'll flush that reverse T3 out of the body quite quickly. Um, so another way, an indirect way to do this would be to boost the T4 to T3 conversion, right? So you're, if you're going to be taking NDT, then you might as well help that, um, help that conversion of T4 to, to T3, and then you can kind of improve that in a roundabout way. So um, using zinc and selenium are some of the supplements. Uh, vitamin A is another good one that increases the hormone sensitivity. So you can do a couple of these things to improve that kind of indirectly. So the next thing is you have to reverse the, reverse the hormones that promote T, T4 to reverse T3 conversion. And specifically, we're talking about leptin and insulin resistance. So here's an example of a patient who has a really high um, reverse T3 at 41.1, which is just insanely high. Um, and this same person had a leptin level of 19.6. So we're looking at thyroid resistance. I don't even, I don't even need to look at the, the free T3 to tell you that this is a person who has... Um, has an issue with reverse T3. In fact, I remember this patient. This is somebody who just did the ECG diet. So if you, if you want to know what it's doing to your body, here it is. Um, the second thing is leptin resistance. This is going to make them gain all the weight back. So leptin is that hormone that makes most, most people after they lose weight gain all their weight back. And then this damages and keeps their metabolism low. And then bit down here, they have this insulin level of 23.8. So this is just a this is a minefield for somebody who's going to, I mean, this is a patient who's going to be crazy, have tons of symptoms of hypothyroidism. They're going to feel cold and fatigued. You know, they're going to probably gain, constantly gain weight. Their metabolism is probably about, you know, 1,000 to 1,200 per day. This is the kind of uh, pattern that you see in a patient like this. Um, and in order to treat this, you, in order to get rid of those reverse T3s, you have to treat these hormones. And so you can do that a lot of ways. I've given you case study examples here, medications and um uh, there's certain medications for leptin resistance and insulin resistance, and then there's other thyroid hormones. I've talked about these in these case studies of patients who lost 40 plus, 50 plus pounds, et cetera. So you can click on those and kind of go through that. The other thing you can do is you can treat indirectly some of these things with berberine, alpha lipoic acid, and chromium. So those are, those are three supplements that I'll use um, often. They shouldn't really be used by themselves, but in conjunction with you know, the, the steps that I've shown you in these case studies up here, these supplements can actually help with that. Okay. Um, the other thing is you really want to address that inflammation and that, that inflammatory process we talked about. So here's the test that you can look at. Check your CRP, check your ESR, check your ferritin, especially if your reverse T3 is high, and then treat those accordingly. So um, mainly, the, where, does this, where does this inflammation come from? In most thyroid patients, it's usually from hormone imbalances like insulin and leptin that we talked about, usually from undiagnosed gut imbalances like SIBO or CIFO, and then undiagnosed food sensitivity. So if I was just going to say from a statistical standpoint, what, why do you have inflammation if you have hypothyroidism or Hashimoto's? It's probably, you know, 95% will have one or more of these three, right? And I, I know that's, for some of you, it's, it's, you know, one out of 20 is not going to work very well. But for the majority of you, this, this, is, this is pretty helpful information. Um, if you do have inflammation, there's a lot of things you can do. You can take myth, milk thistle plus MSM. Um, you can take krill oil plus astaxanthin. You can take curcumin or quercetin and bromelain. So these things actually really help to lower inflammation. They improve, um, they improve elimination of the, the phase one and phase two uh, detoxification pathway in the liver. And the liver then can promote proper um, thyroid conversion and et cetera. So take these supplements, but you need to address it as well with these things. So supplements plus addressing these underlying things will get you the best quality results. Um, and then of course, you have to be doing these things, guys. I, I'm just, we have to talk about them. I know it's, it's more fun to talk about the fancy therapies, but you really have to just get these basics down. So getting seven to eight hours of sleep, reducing or managing your stress, doing low intensity exercise each and every day, doing high intensity exercise when you can as your energy permits. And then of course, a real um, whole food nutritious uh, based diet. Th that's just absolutely essential. If you're not even doing these four, don't you know that's your first place to start right if you like don't 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 get i mean yeah you can you can sprinkle in some supplements here and there if you know what your issue is but if if you haven't even got these basics down and i'll tell you they're actually quite difficult so um but you know but this is the first place to start if that's your issue so um anyway that's pretty much it guys so i know that's a ton of information um you know and please let me know if you have any questions regarding these regarding reverse t3 leave it in the comments below i'm happy to um, try and answer those questions as I as I can. Um, reverse T3 is a very important um, element of thyroid testing, in my opinion, and I think a lot of thyroid 
thyroid, certain patients get missed if you don't test that reverse T3 level. And these are the patients, you guys know, usually know who you are because you're the one that, you know, the doctor looks at you like you're crazy when you tell them you're eating a thousand calories or, you know, whatever, or you just did the HCG diet and you feel cold all the time and you're constantly gaining weight. I mean, you, you kind of have an idea that something's wrong in your body. You just don't have a name for it. Well, this is the name that you're looking for. So um, now treatment, you can probably focus more on the treatment. We glossed over that real quick, but I go back through it. If you have high reverse T3 levels, read that in detail, go to the studies, look up the treatments that I've recommended. Um, I know we went over those super quick, but you should spend some more time looking at that. So um, anyway, guys, that is pretty much it. Any questions, like I said, leave them below. And otherwise, I will uh, look forward to chatting with you guys again soon.